The British public expect their leaders to set out a clear vision to reshape our energy mix against the backdrop not just of global warming, but also of increasing concerns about our national energy security, worries about the quality of life of everybody in our islands, and also the economic opportunities that many of the new energy paradigms present. And today, just briefly, I'd like to share some of our vision for the UK and to explain the Conservatives' approach to delivering change in this vital sector and how we would attack it if we win the election next year. So one thing is absolutely clear, whoever wins the next general election, the status quo is not sustainable. The UK is facing huge challenges. After more than 20 years of liberalised energy markets, we are learning the hard way that being the first in line for cheap energy also means being most hard hit by the continuing escalation in hydrocarbon prices of the last five years. Now that may seem, sound like heresy coming from a, the party of Margaret Thatcher, but I think there is a, an increasingly um, evident uh, shift in the centre ground in the energy debate and we certainly clearly accept as a party that one can no longer be outcome neutral in this energy debate and going forward in the 21st century any government must have a very clear strategy for energy policy and a clear view on, the, on a sensible broad-based energy mix. And the escalation of prices in the last five years has meant the UK consumers bearing the brunt of volatility in gas prices and question marks over security of supplies. The North Sea has begun to, to uh, power down and uh, other gas supplies have come online from places which are considerably less stable. Oil now regularly back creeping past $75 a barrel again and on course for triple figures who knows when. And whilst thermal coal has fallen since its peak in July last year, speculation over supply has already seen a rallying to $76 a tonne from a low earlier in the year of $65. The result has been that even Ofgem have predicted an increase in domestic energy bills of up to 60% by 2016. And when you consider the, out, the very low outlook for overall inflation, that really is a very staggering figure indeed. And on top of this, inadequate gas storage coupled with a looming capacity crunch in 2016, adds a very real concern that voters could very literally be left in the dark. Now, why is that? Because for 10 years, investment in new ca capacity has stymied as utilities have sweated assets and reorganised the corporate landscape to the delight of their shareholders, including many foreign governments, but to the long-term detriment of the interests of British consumers. The predictable outcomes of a government with no clear direction or ambition for the energy sector, coupled with a regulator that has allowed a healthy energy marketplace of more than 20 players to dwindle to an oligopoly of just the big six. And against this backdrop, over the last 10 years, Tony Blair's much vaunted promises of a shift to a low carbon economy have really come to nothing. Despite repeated manifesto promises and international grandstanding, the progress that we've actually made on the ground is very limited. Instead, we've been left trailing European leaders on renewable energy, on green jobs, and on energy efficiency. And this is despite the fact that here in the UK, we have some of the best universities and research facilities for new low carbon technologies and, and uh, future energy that, uh, the best perhaps than anywhere else in the world. This is despite the fact that we have the best natural assets for wave and tidal and offshore wind in Europe. And despite the fact that being home to the global capital for innovative financing <coughs> and the fact that you know, the, the, the uh, City of London despite the uh, fashion for bashing bankers, is nevertheless a global hub for green investment capital, be that debt or equity, and is a precious resource that we must continue to support. 
Why? Because instead of a clear vision, long-term policy frameworks and joined-up thinking, we've been given a piecemeal smorgasbord of poorly tuned and limited scope policy interventions, many of which have been quite sensible in themselves, but taken together have created at best a mixed, at worst a confused picture. And many of these well-intended um, initiatives have, that have created this thicket of overlapping and interrelating measures on offer are almost impenetrable to even the most dedicated new energy investor. Let's imagine for a moment, maybe some of you are. I'm not quite sure, I haven't seen the audience list. But let's imagine that you're trying to set up a small mixed fuel community CHP system. Well, as well as navigate the planning system and secure grid connection, which in itself is no mean feat, you have to develop your business model uh, to include the RO, the renewable heat incentive, the new feed-in tariff regime, and the CCL, and the LECs you might qualify for through it. And to do this, you'll have to keep track of DEC, Ofgem, the Office of Climate Change, the Renewables Advisory Board, the energy team in Burr, now BIS, your local RDA and its renewables spin-out, and probably the Wastewood and Biomass team at DEFRA as well, not to mention the Carbon Trust. And even for consumers, there are a similar number of different competing schemes of one sort or another that could deliver reductions in your energy bill, but probably won't. CERT, CESP, the Environmental Transformation Fund, the Winter Fuel Allowance, the Low Carbon Buildings Programme, I could go on. So, in the over the past few years, whereas in the US, ESCO income has grown from just 3% in 2001 to over 22% now, and where Germany has spent $5.2 billion retrofitting their housing stock, leveraging an additional $19 billion of private investment and recouping $4 billion in tax and creating 140,000 new jobs in the process. The UK, just on energy efficiency alone, has been left with barely a fifth of the green jobs created in Germany. And an expensive and unpopular subsidy regime, and crucially, is failing in its responsibility not just to cut carbon, but also to seize the opportunities of the new low carbon sector. A sector that according to HSBC earlier this year overtook defence and aerospace for global turnover. Further adding to our current challenges are the ongoing ramifications of the credit crunch and the sudden growth in international enthusiasm for low carbon driven by the run into Copenhagen and the new administration over in the States it's going to be even harder for the UK to fight for its place at the centre of global low-carbon investment. So what would a David Cameron administration do differently? Well, in first explaining our approach, I should first underline our complete support for the Climate Change Act 